Good morning and welcome once again to another moment in the Word. We've been looking at the four women that are mentioned in the book of uh, Matthew that are included in the genealogy of our Lord. It is amazing to us that we would find women mentioned and who's mentioned. We looked at Tamar that was mentioned and Rahab yesterday, but today we see Ruth is mentioned. And to find more about the story of Ruth, you would have to go to the book of Ruth. The <laughs> book of Ruth is so amazing. Where it's even located is amazing. It's, mo it's located between the book of Judges and the book of 1 Samuel. The book of Judges end with every man did what was right in his own eyes. It's a period of time of great judgment and chaos, uncertainty in the land. We certainly can relate with that, can't we? And then the book of 1 Samuel is the establishment of the kingdom. When there is going to be some kind of order and there will be a king that will reign over the nation of Israel. This book is also a book that is read in the time of Pentecost in Jewish synagogues. It's also one of two books that's actually named after a woman. One is the book of Esther, who is a Jew, who is one who is um, uh, married to a Gentile. But do you find in the book of Ruth, she is a Gentile that is married to a Jew. It is so interesting, this is a book of romance, but it's also a book of redemption. As we'll try to go through in very quick speed through the book of Ruth, I want you to see the big picture. I want you to understand that this is a picture of God's relationship with us through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and why Ruth is included in this genealogy. It begins in verse 1 by saying it came to pass, and there was a period of the judges, and maybe this is the period in which Gideon actually was the judge in Israel. There was a famine in the land, and famine tongue sometimes causes us to look elsewhere, to go where there's greener grass, and that's precisely what happened. It happened to a man by the name of Elimelech. His name, Eli, means God. Malak means king. God is my king. Oh, but he only is that in name because he will, during this time of famine, when he lives in Bethlehem, Judah. Bethlehem means the house of bread. Judah means praise. He's leaving the place of the house of bread when his name means God is king to go then to a place called Moab which means son of my father or incest, a place of trauma, a place in which there was incest, there was idolatry, there was iniquity, and he takes his family there, and he takes his wife, his wife's name is Naomi, and Naomi goes with their two sons, and that means frail and weakling. And those four people go there shortly after Elimelech dies, Naomi's two sons die, but before they died, they both got married. And that begins the story then of how we find Ruth, because Ruth was married to one of her sons. And Naomi says to her daughter-in-law, you go back to your, the home of your mother. And for a while, the two daughters are very much committed to Naomi. But Ruth, the daughter-in-law of Naomi, says, no, I'm not going back. In fact, she says those famous words that maybe you're familiar with, words that actually cause me to cry as I read them. They're so powerful, so personal. She says, for where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. And we often stop there, but the next verse says, and where you die, I will die. She's willing to commit herself, and that is one of the things that stand out about Ruth. Her name means loyalty and friendship. This is a woman who is loyal, and loyal to, if we look at Naomi, as a picture of Israel. She is committed to Israel. She is committed to the people of Israel. And I pray that you are, that you recognize that God has used the nation of Israel as a way of communicating blessing to the rest of the nations. He did not choose Israel because they were better. He chose Israel because they were the least. 
and he chose them in order that they might be a blessing to others and a blessing to you. Ruth is committed, and as a result, she goes, and they go back together to Bethlehem. And when they arrive, Naomi and Ruth, they're all excited in Bethlehem to see Naomi. Apparently, Naomi and Elimelech were, were people of, of prominence and people of, of great wealth. And, and Naomi had, with Elimelech, left property there that she could uh, now live in. But when they go back, Naomi says, don't call me Naomi. Instead, call me Mara. And Mara or Miriam or Mary means bitter. And she's bitter because, and she says, the Almighty hath dealt with me bitterly. She now is not referring to God in a personal way. She simply acknowledges God is all-powerful. And as so many people, when there are times of adversity, we want to blame God. We say, God has been so mean to me. When that's how she sees it. She does not call him by his personal name. And then we come to chapter 2, and Naomi says that she has a kinsman, and she defines him. She says he's a mighty man of wealth, and he is a man who is related to the family of Elimelech, her husband. His name is Boaz. Remember that name because Boaz means strength. When she just referred to the Almighty, here now she's talking about one who is the Almighty in flesh. Isn't that such a picture of Jesus? And then we find that Ruth now is tasked, and she herself volunteers. She wants to provide for Naomi and herself, and she, she goes to the field. And I love these words. It says that she happened to go to the field of Boaz. There is no such thing as happening. If it happens, or a happy, that is circumstantial. God's fingerprints are all over your life. Nothing happens by chance or accident. God had superintended. He sovereignly had led Naomi. There were many barley fields, but she happened to go to Boaz's field by divine direction. She is there, and while she is there, she's gleaning the field. You see, the way it was back in the ancient world, according to Leviticus 25, it was a mandate. It was a mandate that if you had a field, that you always made sure you left the edges of the field for the poor and the widows to be able to glean from that field. And thereby, she went, and she's gleaning from the edges. Boaz comes and he sees that there is this woman he does not recognize. And so he says to his servants, who is she? And they say, oh, she is with Naomi and she is that Moabitess. And as a result, Boaz takes interest in her and protects her, and says to his manservants, you don't lay a hand on her. And then he provides for her, and makes sure that she is able to glean the fields. Notice that she's constantly stooping. She's constantly serving. She's every time getting a piece of the barley, or later the wheat, and she's having to reach down to get it. But she's so faithful. She is so faithful in providing for Naomi. She's so faithful. And she continues. And then Boaz says to her, I want you to even sit. Don't you go anywhere else. You sit at my lunch table. And what does he serve? Well, it's not a lamb. It's not some kosher meal of great uh, prominence. Instead, it's just simply bread and wine. Isn't that interesting? It's the Lord's table. And so they sit, and she is able to eat with him. And as the story goes on, then she is asked to by Naomi to go, and when he sleeps, you sleep at his feet. You cover his feet. You care for him and continue to serve him. And then what does Boaz say? He says, you are a woman who is of great virtue. 
and that you cared for me. You took care of my feet. How much our feet are vulnerable. They express the intimacy for each of us. Most of us don't allow people to touch our feet. Peter certainly was not too keen on Jesus washing his feet. And maybe you feel that way because feet are intimate. But she cared for and protected even his feet. And that reminds me of Mary Magdalene who washed our Lord's feet and cared for him. Or Mary and Martha, Mary who sat at the feet of Jesus while he taught. Maybe that's what you're doing. You're sitting at the feet of Jesus. And so consequently we find not only does she sit at the feet, but later on Boaz acknowledges that he is a kinsman. He is related to Naomi and as a result now related to Ruth because Ruth, of course, had married one of Naomi's sons. And so he then goes to the elders and he says to the elders of the community, who is it that's related to Naomi more than me? There may be a relative closer. And then he goes and he says, who is it? But none say that they can, even though they may be closer, they don't want to jeopardize their own investment. And so as a result, Boaz not only buys the land, but also pays for Ruth. What a picture it is of the Lord Jesus who bought us, who paid the price, who died on the cross for our sin. And then they're married. And as a result, Ruth and Boaz have a child, and his name is Obed. And his name Obadiah means, and you can uh, extrapolate that to Obadiah, means to serve. It also, Obed, means to worship. Jesus came as a servant, and also he is one to be worshipped. I pray you worship him today. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for your son. Thank you for your spirit. And we pray, Father, if there's anyone listening who does not know Messiah, the Lord Jesus, as their personal Savior, that you, Father, would reveal him to them and they would confess their sin and acknowledge Jesus as Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.